Welcome to the Christ and Classics podcast, where we consider the classics in light of the Christ. I'm Colton Moore. And I'm Devin Wilkins. And this is episode five, the Iliad, book four. Boom. Um, it's about to get pretty... It's, it's not gonna. It's about to not be pretty in this book. So, well, prepare yourselves. Can I summarize it for us? Take go. Take it away. All right. So the guys, the guys, the the uh, the armies, they battle on Earth, and it kind of parallels what's going on in Olympus in the heavens. Zeus is arguing that Menelaus has won, and thus the gods should bring peace to their armies. Although he, he does it all kind of maybe tongue in cheek because he's chiding Hera <laughs> and and um, Athena in the process. Anyway, Typ- typical back. typical Zeus. Yeah, always always marriage conflict. Hera lashes back at Zeus, countering that he doesn't respect all of her labors for the Achaeans, implying that the Greeks should destroy Troy. And Zeus says, "Okay." Um, uh, on the understanding that he gets to destroy three of her cities uh, that she loves. And so he sends Athena into the battlefield to rekindle the fighting uh, by causing the Trojans to break the sworn truce that Priam mm-hmm. had made and trample on the Argives. Uh, and then Athena tempts the Trojan archer Pandarus, or as my friend Colton might say, Pandarus. I'll say Pandarus. <laughs> <laughs> With the glory he should receive by killing Menelaus. Except he Ooh. doesn't kill him. He lets that arrow go. It flies, hits uh, Menelaus, but only wounds him. Oh, uh, before it, that, before that. like it, it flies, and then Athena just takes her little pointer finger and just goes, boop. And it just takes a side to the left. More of a, and, and, more and... Of a graze. <laughs> more of a graze. But interestingly... I was trying to figure out where it actually hit him, but it seems kind of interesting. But it breaks the truce. Oh. And so Agamemnon Not leads the charge bad. to attack the Trojans for breaking the oath. And Ajax, Odysseus, Diomedes, they all follow suit and they slaughter countless Trojans. And the Trojans also slaughter a lot of Greeks. The gods become involved too. The battle um, ensues really with their help. Athena drives on the Argives and Ares musters the Trojan allies and Apollo spurs on the Trojans themselves. The truce is utterly failed and the book ends with this sentence. Ah. That day, ranks of Trojans, ranks of Achaean fighters sprawled there, side by side, face down in the dust. Ah. Oof. Yeah. Yeah, this is a it's a pretty interesting, a pretty interesting turn in the story, because uh, right in the middle of book three, you 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 see Menelaus dragging Paris by the throat, and he's about to kill him. It's like, all right, Menelaus is gonna win. He's gonna get his girl. They're gonna go back home. Sweet, mm-hmm. come on, peace, peace. Yes, like, <laughs> and, and and both sides are are, are yearning. Yes, peace, finally, finally. It seems like the Trojans are like, please just kill him. <laughs> right, right. And like, we'll that's pay a profound point in itself. <laughs> like, what is what is peace in this book? Anyways, um, and then Aphrodite steals Paris away. So we talked about last episode. And then now, it's like, okay, what's going to happen? Well, Menelaus is back on the ground saying, I won, I won. And the, mm-hmm. uh, the Greeks are cheering. And then Athena, who's for the Greeks, needs a pretext. And so she comes down and she's like, just just as um, Aphrodite went into Helen's ear last book and was like, oh, wouldn't it be great? These two men fighting all for you. And Athena comes down in Pandarus' ear and is like, ah, Pandarus, just think you, all the glory you would receive if you just flung your little arrow and killed um uh, killed Menelaus, how they would praise your name for days to come. Mm. And he's like, oh, yes. It, it, it's, kind of, it's kind of like, um, uh, <laughs> I, I know a guy, well, <laughs> <laughs> I, <on>. sorry. <laughs> I just got us in my head and it's just, it's, it's pretty hilarious. I'm just thinking of like the guy who's like, like, oh gosh, the, 
the cryptocurrency markets exploded and, he, and he's just like seeing dollar signs in his mind that are just never going to come <laughs> to fruition. And he makes all these stupid decisions financially and like and that uh, sells the farm uh, uh, a month from now. He's going to be really sad that he did until Padaris mm-hmm. is like, Oh, the glory. Oh yes, yes, yes. Okay, fine. I'll I'll taste my arrow. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and then the truce is broken and you think, what just happened? Something bad's about to happen. Like all hell is about to break loose on, on both mm-hmm. sides. W- mm-hmm. What's going to happen? And what really does happen is like Ajax, Odysseus, and Diomedes, they slaughter a bunch of Trojans. Like mm-hmm. gruesome, gruesome deaths. Yeah. But what I want to focus on is just more broadly, as the men are, are battling there in the dust on Mount Olympus, the gods, Mount Olympus, this really nebulous place, <laughs> no pun <Yep>. intended, <laughs> <laughs> where it's like a, this mysterious uh, interaction between creation and the, the, this heavenly realm, the gods themselves are fighting. And so they're really involved in, in a few different ways. And my question is, like, what advantage is it? for the gods to labor on behalf of the men. This is a theme that's going to come out that has already made its head uh, very clear, and it's going to progress throughout the Iliad. But what's in it for the gods to labor on behalf of men? So in in this book, at least, in book four, look at, uh, where is it, lines 29 and 30, we see a little argument with between Zeus and uh, Hera, uh, typical typical mm-hmm. um where she gets angry right she gets angry because zeus is like well okay menelaus won uh he won the battle helen come on out greeks let's get ready to pack up and Harris, <laughs> whoa 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 i've been laboring too long and too hard for these achaeans to not destroy troy you need to honor that zeus and so mm-hmm. for hera there seems to be some sort of glory or honor or dignity that she places in her role as um, a supporter of the Greeks. And then yeah. for Zeus, it, we see it in a threat that Helen, uh, not Helen, Hera gives uh, to Zeus where she says, mm-hmm. if you go through with this, Zeus, you who control all things, who who um, we can't yield to you, like... Uh, you can do whatever you want. If you do this, meaning you take the Greeks away, they win, and without destroying Troy, none of the gods will praise you. And so in my mind, I'm thinking, well, why why would Zeus want praise from the gods? What's like, mm. What benefit really is that? And maybe it's such a confusion for me. Like Maybe this is such a question for me because um, I'm a Christian, and the god that we worship and serve is one that's not benefited at, at all by our worship of him. He, he, he delights in us and that's why we praise him. And, and that's why the Israelites sacrifice it, it, Even though the sacrifices were, were a, a fragrant aroma, it, the, the scriptures say, hmm. it's not as if like God was waiting and longing for that meat to eat and enjoy. Uh, otherwise he wouldn't have enjoyed a, a nice meal. So yeah. what's, what's going on here? I, I, I'm not entirely sure. Well, uh, I, I'll push back against that a tiny bit. That mean, isn't God motivated by his own glory? Uh-huh. That's all I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> whoa, 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 wait, wait, wait. How is that, how is that a pushback to me? Well, you said that uh, uh, God is not motivated by what he would receive, but, but you know, f- uh, he's motivated by, oh, how did you put it, for us or something like that? Like, like, I guess God isn't longing for the praise as a human would long for praise, as if he would be dissatisfied. Yeah. Right, definitely not. Yeah, like, like dissatisfied in a in in a in a way that is, I don't know. Um, He's not needy. Right, right. There's nothing that we can add to him or help him feel that makes, <laughs> right. that, you know, completes God. 
uh, it does seem like the the Greek gods are are uh, I think we've said this before they are human except deathless. So even even that quote you read here it says do as you please but none of the deathless gods will ever praise you right these these gods do not die they're, they're amplified humans because they just don't die and um but yeah i, I think there's something in every human um that wants you know wants I don't at glory for sure, but but uh, there wants to be thought well of, you know, maybe a fear of other people's uh, perception of you, I guess. Yeah, yeah, and it's so interesting because, and and maybe it's because I'm a Christian and I and I've got these presuppositions that that I'm necessarily uh, reading through which I'm necessarily reading Homer and not necessarily in a, I'm, I'm not talking about the, well, well, I guess maybe I am the, the, the explicit reading heck uh, Homer through the lens of Christ. So maybe this is what I, what we mean by it, because I have a conception of God as immortal, deathless, of course. Mm-hmm. Um, well, in a sense, because 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 the, because of the incarnation that, that kind of complicates that whole thing matter. But I'm not, I'm not going to touch he on that. He conquered death, anyways. Of course, of course. But like yeah. he's upright. He, he's the the moral standard of of all morality. Right. And all morality s- takes its uh, it comes from him. Right. And he's so, so completely self sufficient. Mm-hmm. And. Zeus, who's supposed to be God of gods, does not fit the bill whatsoever. I mean, he's yeah. powerful. He's strong. He can, he can destroy or he can overpower all the gods combined. But, right. I mean, we haven't talked about it yet, but he still has what's called fate to reckon with, which is mm-hmm. this quiet um, force behind everything in, in the Iliad. Right. And... What's in it for him? What's he gaining? Uh, I, is it is it merely the praise of the gods? Is it merely the praise of of men? That does he need that? Does Hera need Zeus's approval? Well, he definitely uh, doesn't seem as though he enjoys the chronic conflict. You know, the railing against one another, he and Hera, uh, or or do you think he does? I, it, Maybe yeah, it's I was possible gonna, he does actually. <laughs> maybe you you we ended last episode with some with some uh, thoughts that we had, I think it, that it came about just from us uh, recording that that episode and the the thought centered around this war story being also a story of family as well, and here with Zeus and Hera, yet again you have some more marital conflict and yet again. Zeus seems like a passive, a kind of a passive aggressive, uh, mm-hmm. or, or 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 a passive husband. Because like, like book two, it's really clear that Zeus bowed his head before the Greeks set off. Bowed right. his head for what? That Troy would be destroyed. Zeus knows that. He's promised that. It's irrevocable. He can't change it. And so why would he go go back on that? And could it be one possibility could be that he's just trying to shirk his responsibility, go back on his promise or Mm. the second, Mm. which I find more the second, this question, which, which I find a little bit more profound is maybe Zeus is more like humans than uh, we, we maybe give credit meaning Zeus bowed his head to destroy Troy. Ultimately irrevocable. That will happen. Yep. But but somehow, in a real sense, maybe he's forgotten it and has gotten so wrapped up in Menelaus seemingly winning this duel against Paris that he's like, oh, okay, he just won. And we see his fallibility there. And if it wasn't for Hera checking him in the scene, 
to say, hey, whoa, whoa, no, 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 no. You need to uh, let me destroy Troy. If it wasn't for that, perhaps his original vow wouldn't even be fulfilled. So uh, it, it's, it's kind of this... It, mm-hmm. It, it, it's like this, like, like Hera's counter is, is is a means toward this greater end that Zeus really isn't even in control of, <laughs> but he is because he's Zeus. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yeah, well, really... we we saw. Uh, what book was that? Book one, maybe. Uh, <clears throat> Zeus was. Oh, after he had bowed his head, I suppose to, to Thetis. He, you know, he allows for all, you know, how many steps uh, apart from him does he go about, right? Basically, he, he ends up angering Hera and Athena because the Greeks start to turn around. And so he gets Hera and Athena to do his bidding for Thetis by... <laughs> By uh, <laughs> total indirect means, right? So there's, it's interesting that he seems to govern by mockery and indirect, uh, and I suppose yeah. we call that passive action. Yeah. And I, my question is, I wonder if, uh, my question is, is, does Homer intentionally want us to view that negatively as you and I are doing right now? as if uh, another model of a husband not to emulate. Zeus, the god of gods, has for a wife the the goddess of marriage, and he is a pitiful husband who is not only an adulterer like Paris, but a passive uh, accomplisher of his own whim, whims. And... Yeah. If I mean, um, go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead. I, I, I've, I've been thinking about this because I, I'm thinking. Okay, so Homer, what is he trying to communicate in regards to the the worldview, the kind of the the, the Greek worldview, and going back to that previous. Uh, statement that Prime had made in the in Book Three. I hold the gods to blame. They're the ones who brought this war upon me. You know, mm-hmm. Helen regretting her situation, uh, and then you just see these gods enforcing their own their own wills, and uh, on some some level that we it seems that we have the gods doing what they want to do. Uh, regardless of the consequences upon the lives of these people, uh, the, it's almost like it's entertainment. <laughs> you know? mm. Like like they're playing a video game or something, and you know the the characters will keep doing things when you're not actively uh, playing. Oh, interesting. But, but but they come in and do whatever they want to do and add conflict and and it seems pretty self centered on on the god's behalf and the gods are going to figure out how to get along you know that sort of thing Uh, they will outlast these heroes but um so uh, you start to view or at least i start to view the greeks and the trojans as something of pawns you know maybe you're within their their whims for the moment but i mean it's going to take odysseus another 10 years to get home you know yeah yeah. because uh poseidon is ticked at him and yeah and poseidon is on his side here in in the uh in the iliad or i i can't remember is are there any hints that poseidon specifically does not like odysseus i haven't i haven't paid attention um maybe i should going forward just to see if there's any foreshadow um, um, into the Odyssey. Yeah, you know, honestly, I don't recall, uh, f- you know, later passages in the Iliad along those lines, but it's possible. Yeah, okay. certainly. Um, you know, putting out 
Poseidon's son doesn't help. But yeah, one thing. This is like a a side note. This is not directly attached to the to the question, but it it it, it happens periodically throughout the Iliad that at see and it seems at pretty important junctures where you're reading along and there's an obvious uh, narrator speaking in the third person um, mm-hmm. and then it goes into dialogue where it goes into dialogue um, but then at times uh, the narrator addresses the it seems like the reader in the second person singular but mm. mingled with another character so like in book 4 line uh, lines 147 or so like uh, pandarus's eros um it says at the, at the end of the paragraph there in figgles edition the string mm. sang out arrow shot away razor sharp and raging to whip through the argive ranks here it is but you ha we're still we're still in a narrative but like a third person narrative but you Right. Second person singular, Menelaus. It's like, well, me? I'm not Menelaus. I'm the reader. <laughs> so we're talking. So we're talking to Menelaus now. Okay, interesting. But you, Menelaus, the blessed, deathless gods did not forget you, Zeus's daughter, the queen of of fighters, first of all. And Athena d- deflects the arrow. But throughout throughout the book, throughout the poem, uh, the muses are invoked. But which is to be expected from the from the proem, the the prologue. Right. But sometimes. A character, or even the reader, is addressed in the second person as if we've now shifted our attention and we're actually talking to someone within the story. And I don't know why that is. My my background knowledge of um, uh, the characteristics of of epic literature and Homeric literature are are real general, and I haven't um, dug into that. I'm sure there are scholarly articles and books that were that have been written on this on this and, and how they function, but what are your thoughts? Those articles sound really boring. <laughs> oh, they sound fascinating. They sound fascinating and illuminating. I, and enlightening. I would rather engage the imaginative story. <laughs> oh, but that, but like, but like understanding what's going on here will like enhance, enhance the imaginative uh, side of all. It's, it's, it's like, it's like. I kind of like to think of it as maybe, maybe <laughs> the. The the bard is actually in the presence of Menelaus post war. Oh, wow! Oh, you know, interesting. But you, he dies. Menelaus. But he but he dies oh. soon after coming back. Right? <laughs> <Nope>. <laughs> Clotonestra gets him. His wife. That's right. Oh, another family drama. <laughs> Don't spoil That's right. it. Hey, but spoilers yeah. all over the place. Oh. I was trying to keep the the audience on their toes. You know. Yeah. <laughs> well it, anyways yeah. no yeah I, I don't know I, yeah it is kind of a strange second person uh, it's as though the bard is addressing Menelaus himself but I, I, yeah, for what I, purpose I don't, I don't I don't know so yeah I don't some strange you. thing yeah well but can I can I try to summarize a little bit here um I'm sure you can I yeah some other... Uh, Why well, I'd say try, because I might do a really bad job and I'll need you to come and clean up. Uh, Take it away. So, but you were wondering, you know, what gain there is for the gods to be involved in the lives of, of men here. And I'm thinking that it's all their gain, uh, their amusement. Uh, they're, they're having a good old time. It's like their call of duty. That's right. The video game. <laughs> yeah. I haven't played it, but I, I know exactly oh, what you're talking about. Wow. Um, yeah. They're, you got half the gods in one room and half the gods in another room, and they're going to battle and playing Halo or something. <laughs> and <clears throat> they seem to have be having a great time. You know, they're, they're fighting kind of uh, you know, this proxy war through, through humanity. But when I step back and think about what does this have to say about the the Greek humans' view of life, uh, it's pretty bleak. Mm-hmm. The gods are not necessarily for you. You are at their disposal. Even you know Helen in the previous book, 
she's forced really to keep on keeping on with with Paris. Yeah. Um, this is, uh, the, I mean, there are no real friends of the gods. I mean, right now, Paris, okay, but but he's also infamous. I mean, he's not he's not a loved character. Um, so I'm coming away from this. That there's a lot of gain for the gods. There's minimal gain for humanity from the Greek worldview. There's ultimately, uh, it, yeah, it's just, it's bleak. Uh, the, the gods are not on your side, even though in this book, book four, they, they claim, you know, God, these gods are on my side or those gods are on their side or something like that. Mm-hmm, but, right. You know, yeah. Maybe today. <laughs> yeah. But, but, uh, the gods are fickle and the gods fight among themselves and you are a pawn. Praise be to the Lord of uh, God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is for us. There's no condemnation for us who are in Christ Jesus. You know, our Mm. reality is not that of the Greek worldview. Mm. Um, And so we see, I think at least personally, I'm coming away with, a lot of contrast here. Um, is that fair? No, that's great. That's great. Um, it's, I, I just try to keep putting myself in Achilles' shoes. Achilles has chosen this route. I mean, he's he's laying silent right now. We don't hear here. We don't we we don't hear a lot from him mm-hmm. in, the, in these last two books. But we know that he's going to Troy to burn it to the ground so that he can, whenever he dies, get the praises of the plebs. He, 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 and it's like, and then he's dead and people praise your name. So what? Mm-hmm. We'll um, actually visit him after he dies in the I know, Odyssey. I know. And it's a really sad, no, it's a no, really sad scene. we can't talk scene. about that. I know, I know. <laughs> but it's just, the hope of the resurrection, like yeah. physical, literal resurrection, new heavens and new earth. Like This is a side note. Here recently, whenever I talk about heaven, either with my students or my children, or I even just think about it, I've been forcing myself to say the new heavens and new earth as yeah. opposed to just heaven or glory. I, I say new heavens and new earth specifically right. to remind myself that that moment whenever... Uh, we cross over, and however long it takes, I, I don't know what happens immediately after death. If you're immediately there, I mean, Christ says to the thief on the cross, you'll be with me today in paradise, but other texts mm-hmm. seem to suggest there may be some intermediate state. I don't know. Anyways, whenever we get there, <laughs> whenever we get there, there'll be grass and, and, and rivers. There'll be trees. I like to think there'll be birds, and, and the light will be the light of Christ's glory. You mean we won't be deathless shades? Ah, and that's a real hope. And oh, no, lifeless shades. Sorry, lifeless. Right, shades. <laughs> it, and it that's that kind of hope propels you forward. That mm-hmm. kind of hope is what drives um, Christian men into battle of all sorts, into wars of all kinds, like literal and metaphorical, with with a, with a confidence that says, "There's more. There's more after I die." This is this is the kind of hope that um, keeps an eighty-year-old man and woman um, from s- sinking into the the despair of of old age and and the the body being more decrepit. It's like the body's wasting away, but whenever we mm. whenever we go, ah, uh, it's gonna be wonderful. It's gonna be wonderful. And you don't see that here with, with the Greeks. And, um, yeah, they're seeking to attain uh, fame. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that will outlive them, and it doesn't look too promising. But, but even, you know, <laughs> their their current station in life at the whims of the gods is also not good. So, so, (laughs) you know, 
um, in contrast with the false teaching of prosperity gospel today, they don't get their best life now or ever. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, and so uh, that's why we need um, Christ to be our vision and amen. to take us away with that vision, perhaps in some kind of smooth <laughs> smooth jazz cue the solo <laughs> oh, bring it on Micah Waking here we go let's rock sleeping thy presence my light Interested in growing your ancient language skills but not sure where to start? Glow's House can help. From illustrated readers and short stories to lexicons and grammars, Glow's House offers a variety of resources for beginning, intermediate, and experienced ancient language learners. Head to glowsahouse.com today. Glow's House, language resources for the global community.